Our first uh, speaker uh, today uh, is Matteo Di Tullio. Uh, Matteo is assistant professor in early modern history at the University of Pavia, and his research focuses on social and economic history in pre-industrial Europe. He is interested in questions of labor mobility, but also in the practices of management of natural resources and social inequality in northern Italy in the early modern period. And he is the author of several monographs and articles. I won't go through all of them. I will just mention the last two uh, from 2019, the lion's share, inequality and the rise of the fiscal state in pre-industrial Europe, who he wrote with uh, um, Guido Alfani by Cambridge University Press. And in 2014, the wealth of communities, war, resources and cooperation in Renaissance uh, uh, Lombardy, um, published by Ashgate. The paper is going to present today is Coping with Water, Economy, Ecology and Conflicts in Early Modern Lombardy. Thank you so much, Matteo, for being with us today. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lavinia, for this very kind presentation. And thank you to the organizer for inviting me and give me the opportunity to to present my, my research. Um, I'm sharing my presentation. I hope that uh, all uh, it, work, it works cor cor correctly. So I, I must confess that uh, you, to you that it was anything but easy to, to choose on which aspect uh, focuses on for, for, for this talk. Uh, because the relationship between human and water in uh, early modern Lombardy was so crucial and significant that we could get lost investigating thousands of aspects, probably for, for many days, but we have not all this time. It is having in mind uh, this complexity that finally I abandoned any idea to focus on some case studies and I decided uh, to present some general ideas that I developed on this subject, uh, which I think it could be useful to discuss with you today. <clears throat> Some preliminary clarification are necessary. What I'm presenting to you is based on different research that I have already done on the water management in the long early modern period from 1400 to the 1900 in Lombardy. That means mainly on the low plains of the state of Milan, the dark green region in this map, and only partially on the western provinces of the Republic of Venice, Bergamo, Brescia, Crema, in the light green, the light green one region in this map. Focusing partially on the water work, uh, particularly on the water works and water networks as infrastructure during the above mentioned period and territory, I would like to discuss uh, with you four main points to which I will focus in detail during my talk. Coping with water is first, was first an ecological issue. This is my first point. Second, it was a collective goal promoting cooperation. Third, it implies the development of, of an alive infrastructure. And the last and in consequence of these three points, it produced congenital litigation. So the litigation is a constant in the history of water management in this territory. Let's begin. Between the spring and the summer of 1495, returning from Naples together with the army of the King of France, Philippe de Comin, as a good chronicler and an expert diplomat, spent his days carefully taking notes on his notebooks of everything that happened or surprised him in the travel throughout Italy. A few years later, those notes would serve him to draw up his memoir, in which, among the main political, diplomatic and military facts, he, he did not fail to report his amazement in seeing, I quote, the Lombardy Plain 
which is one of the most beautiful and richest countries in the world and the most populated. Fertile as much of good crops as in good wines and fruit, and where surprisingly, I added, the lands are never at rest. In other words, the Comin, as many other travelers coming to Italy for their grand tour or other institutional necessity, was impressed by the already quite widespread for field or continuous rotation system and by the practically absent practice to leave part of plots fellow as common as were, and the integration with the transhumant and stable livestock. The landscape magnified by the French diplomat, full of ditches like the native Flanders and more, and quoting, was the result of a century old process of domestication of environment, the result of the cooperation between the reproductive work of nature and the constant human work and care on this work. So it is necessary to keep in mind some geopedological and hydrographical peculiarities of the Po Valley to fully understand what I've just mentioned. The Po Valley is divided in a dry plain characterized by permeable soil and a low impermeable plain characterized by the presence of abundant water bring by many rivers continuously fed by the perennial snow on the Alps and by the springs generated by the water stored in the underground of the dry plain and which gush up meeting the impermeable soil of the low plain. In fact, coming down from the upper lands at the foot of the Alps toward the lower plain before being artificially constructed, the courses of the rivers became less defined, with low banks, increasing wide beds, and gains of confluences that made entire region almost permanently swampy and unsuitable for human settlement. And this phenomenon, as, already, as I already mentioned, was also accentuated by the abundant presence of springs generated by the underground water, which finding impermeable soils in the low plain, crush it up to the surface and feed the system of extensive swamps already created by the water of rivers. It is not needless to say that in the low plain of Lombardy, the water management has always been the condition sine qua non to settling and working these places. This last is the first point that I would like to stress in the presentation. Coping with water in the low plain of Lombardy was first of all an ecological issue because part of this plain was unsuitable, uh, was unable to stable human settlement without a previous hydraulic stabilization. Just to be clear, I use the word ecology to identify all the human actions in respect to the local environment and implemented in order to combine the human need to live and work in a place and the autonomous activities of nature. In this perspective, therefore, the search for an ecological balance is to be read as a human attempt to combine his needs, exploiting and forging as much as possible the independent production activity of nature and partially adapting to the environment. At the same time, using the word economy, I refer primarily to all the activity for the exploitation of local resources, particularly to guarantee a kind of local reproduction more than to pursue uh, the production goal typical of the market economy. Obviously, this does not mean that it was not possible to carry out any economic activities or some form of temporary settlement in the low plains of Lombardy pre-hydraulic arrangement, but that the installation of rural settlement with all the consequences of this was possible only after a domestication of the environment. 
<clears throat> in other words, in the low plain of Po Valley, the development of an agrarian economy was possible only by obtaining a kind of hydraulic equilibrium, of course, from a human perspective, this hydraulic equilibrium, with the future advantage to make available a resource of primary importance for the agrarian exploitation of these lands. I will not go into the, the details of question already analyzed in some previous essays by myself or, or other authors, but I think it is important at least to summarize the main aspects of the intricate relationship between human and water in the low plane of Lombardy. Very briefly, after the first systematic reclamation of the low plains favored by the so-called Centuriazione during the Roman period, it was from the 13th century that a new water culture stimulated a generalized process of hydraulic works. The Navigli and the Muzza, very important canal promoted by the Duke or the municipality of Milan, soon represent the main axis of a network that was becoming more and more dense, also thanks to the practice to establish consortia and companies between the landowners for excavation of new channel of new ditches cables in order to face the construction and the management costs. Controlling the water was an important factor of social and political power, as well as a great economic, economic deal. <clears throat> Just to provide an example, we could consider the income set statement of the Cavallera Crivella Canal, owned by the wealthy and very powerful Tribulzio family, who in the 1569 obtained an enormous net income, representing more than 70% of the total revenue. Anyway, the participation to the irrigation network was not a prerogative of the richest part of the society. In fact, if the creation of a large canal or the extraction of water from the river were subject to obtaining a ducal licenses, considering that the rivers and their water were considered ducal heritage, and these ducal licenses were mostly obtained by urban or rural communities, main religious and social institution or noble families, on the contrary, the development of the secondary and tertiary network was favored by the so-called servitù di acquedotto, a juridic institution of consuetudinary origin, but, but recognized by the municipal statutes and then by the state legislation, which made it possible for each one to pass a canal on others' people land upon the payment of uh, the price of the land occupied increased by a quarter of its market value. In other words, once that the right to dig and feed a main canal was acquired, or a spring that was domesticated throughout a fountain, the water network spread rapidly and extensively in a vast territory, thanks to the building and uh, thanks to the building of uh, dividers and the throughout a dense network of canals overlapped one each other by means of bridges and tombs. In some cases, the plot of canals was so dense that it was difficult to immediately understand the origin of, the, uh, of each of them. Usually the people who obtained the right to extract water from a canal, the users, formed, as I said, a consortium to which they delegate the authority to coordinate the management of each canal and to solve at the first stage the litigations between the users. Normally, each of the users benefited from the water for a certain number of hours, depending on the shifts established by the so-called will, even throughout episodes of arbitrary appropriation beyond the 
allowed uh, amount were irregularity, even following the fraudulent opening of new intake. I will return later on the dispute connected to the spread of the water work. Now I would like to focus on my second main point. What I just mentioned, in fact, shows that the management of water was a collective goal involving public and private institutions, local and central government, wealthy and poor people. In fact, in addition to the primary above remembered ecological value, the waterworks add many other general values, like protection, disinfection, alimentation, commerce, and so on. In many cases, this public value was guaranteed by the common property of part of the waterworks system by local communities or by the states. In many other, as already mentioned, the collective property or management was possible thanks to the creation of consortia or other collective institution among those entitled to benefit from a specific canal or ditch. The relevance of the irrigation consortia to promote an enduring and profitable management system of water is confirmed not only by the long-term assistance of this institution, but also by the analysis of many agronomists and engineers during the 18th and 19th century, like John Simmons, Arthur Young, Richard Weiss Smith, just to give some example, coming to Lombardy to study the sophisticated irrigation network and favorable impressed by the diffusion and the excellent functioning of this institution is this irrigation consortia. Still some decades after, among the other technical problem, the commission charged to dig the Villoresi Canal north and to Milan considered the realization and the future management of this uh, infrastructure al almost impossible if the landowners of that region had not formed a consortium. All this above mention is related to a specific characteristic of water supply network, namely to be in a live infrastructure. This kind of infrastructures could be considered alive from an ecological point of view and not only for the above mentioned intraabic equilibrium necessary for the human settlement. The water infrastructure, in fact, alter the local ecosystem, but at the same time, they become an integral part of it. We could consider, for example, the relationship with the local flora or fauna and the collateral economic activity that are created, or that with the changing flow of river of their courses, or even the climatic changes that also affected the Po Valley during the early modern period. A same canal, moreover, could encounter different soil consistencies, even in a short distance, even at a short distance, providing benefits or not to different plots of, of lands on the basis of their consistency or of their economic vocation. Just for example, think to the disputes between the spread of the irrigated crops and the mulberry trees, which invested Lombardy during the 18th century, or that were related to the diffusion of rice paddies uh, from 16th century onwards, because they were considered the cause of the spread of a terrible disease, the malaria. Moreover, this could be considered an alive infrastructure because it creates a feed a, and feed a new hydra, hydraulic cycle, which influences not only the flow of the river and the dynamics of the spring, but also the consistency of the underground aquifers. In fact, all the water that comes from the water supply network return to the river or to the underground aquifers thanks to the ability of the farmers and the other workers involved in the water management and the implementation of a system of canals for the recycle of water. In other words, the water supply network is influenced and at the same time it influences the natural water cycle. The water supply network is alive also because it was continuously increased. 
as I said before, partially because the creation, particularly because the creation of a principal line sooner or later favored the development of a secondary and tertiary network, as well as it stimulated the exploitation of this resource for new uses. So in general, the growing of the water supply stimulates new economic activities, which in a context of reciprocal influences, favor the further development of water works. All these had an obvious influence on the alteration of the local ecosystem so that the above mentioned process restart again and again during the time. Moving to the conclusion, it is time to soften this sort of bucolic picture provided until now by remembering that the formation process of development of the irrigation network did not took place always according to a linear trajectory, nor anywhere according to a similar chronology. There are a lot of difference in between the different part of the low plane in Lombardy. Above all, however, and this is my fourth and last point, the advance or the, the increase of the irrigation was not only a triumphal process, nor a neutral one, as I already mentioned. I have already remembered the alteration of the ecosystem produced by the reclamation activities connected with the development of the irrigation network, as well as to the new settlement of economic opportunities promoted by the irrigation system. All this said, it is quite easy to understand how these infrastructures Im in immediately also became the subject of disputes. To stress this last point, I refer very briefly to a research devoted to the reconstruction of water conflicts dynamics in the low plain of Milan and Brescia during, uh, uh, during the early modern period. Uh, for time constraints, I skip any detailed description regarding the sources and other technical cons uh, technicality concerning uh, the data collection. But if you like, I could return uh, on this uh, during the discussion or provide uh, any other in information that you that you need. Uh, I prefer to concentrate it to one of the main conclusion to which I arrive uh, with the, this research and that I think can be useful in the argument that I'm developing. What I found with the quantification, but particularly uh, even more with the qualification of uh, these water conflicts, is that the increasing of water disputes is not only related to growing interest in the control of the resources or to the market pressure on these resources, to increasing conflict interest, to the recurrent arbitrary extraction of water and so on, that are all obviously um, part of the story. But also, so this increasing dispute is also related to the abandonment or, or the lack of the maintenance uh, in, this, uh, in, in the use of these resources. For example, in phase of population decrease or after a flooding. The number and the duration of conflicts grew up in that case exactly when this condition, population decrease and weather instability, became much more evident, such as during the 17th century, as we can see in this graph. There were obviously many other factors uh, that influence the dynamics of these conflicts. Uh, uh, it, it's, it is not all as simple as I said you just now, but the MO mention aspect gives me the opportunity to stress the point that the disputes were related particularly to the specific environmental context of the low plain of Lombardy and the peculiarity of the water supply network as infrastructure. In fact, its ecological and collective value, as well as its alive nature, makes it inevitably, inevitably 
sorry, subject to disputes, both for a reason of appropriation and for the need of maintenance. Thank you very much for your attention. And the micro, Lavinia. The micro. Apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matteo, for this uh, very interesting presentation, which raises questions that were also a bit touched upon yesterday with uh, the question of water as an infrastructure and uh, like in relation, of course, to economic and uh, ecological and social conflicts. Um, and we, we have the discussion at the end, and I'm sure there would be lots of uh, of connections. Um, so uh, I will now introduce uh, our next speaker, who is the uh, team uh, Soens. Uh, I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly in Flemish. Um, I know it's a bit uh, <laughs> hard. And um, Tim is professor of medieval and environmental history at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And within the Antwerp Center for Urban History, he has developed a new research cluster, Environmental and Neural History of Urbanized Societies. And his research focuses on natural hazards and disasters in pre 19th century, uh, sorry, pre 1900 Europe. And uh, he pays a particular attention to floods, pandemics, and famines. Uh, he has a very wide range of publications, so I will just mention the last two from 2020 2019. Uh, the 2021 published by Cambridge University Press uh, and uh, 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 co authored uh, is Disasters and History The Vulnerability and Resilience of Past Societies. And 2019 uh, by Routledge, um, an edited volume of Urbanizing Nature actors and agency, uh, disconnecting cities and nature since 1500s. So today, Tim is going to talk about sea walls reworked, envirotech, climate change and labor on the North Sea coast before 1900. Thank you so much for being with us today and I leave you the floor. Thank you very much, Lavinia. Um, and thanks also to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of such an outstanding workshop with all of you and so much expertise uh, all together. Uh, I hope you can hear me. If not, give me a sign. I try to share my presentation. If something goes wrong, um, please let me let me know. This was already the last slide should be the first, which you see now, I hope. Let me know if, if uh, that we, works. We lost the, the slides. We, OK. So I saw them uh, for a second and then they disappeared. OK, I try again. Here we are. Going to presentation mode, if that works. OK, you see it now? Yes. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Well, before taking you to the cold waters of the North Sea during a winter storm, I wanted to start in last July when southern Belgium and northwest Germany were hit by torrential rains, which caused major river flood damage. And this was very unusual because of two reasons. First of all, it was summer. And in this region, it normally this region doesn't suffer from flooding in the summer. And secondly, and most importantly, around 240 people lost their lives. 240 people today in Belgium and Northwest Germany. While there is no reason that anyone should ever be killed in river floods in this part of Europe today. The reason uh, of this uh, river flooding was a stationary low pressure field which remained in place for about 48 hours or more and caused 200 liters of rain to fall in one and the same uh, region and part of this uh, area. In Belgium, the hardest hit uh, area was the river valley of the Vesder, which is a tributary uh, river of the Meuse river basin, which completely inundated. 
Here, the floods can be seen as a sort of typical failure of modern hard infrastructure, riverbanks without buffer capacity to accommodate floodwaters, and 19th century dams, which had to regulate and stabilize the water levels, um, which might remind you to Giacomo Parinello's talk yesterday. Well, the, the dams you see here, they did not break, but during the extreme rainfall, they had to be opened because they had exceeded maximum capacity and their managers feared that they would break. So the additional water was just released as if the dam did not exist, causing, according to eyewitnesses, tsunami-like waves uh, further downstream. Before 1800, the river infrastructure had been much softer, with extensive river marshes, which basically flooded every winter and served as a sort of buffer capacity coping with um, floodwaters. But in the 19th century, this river valley industrialized and first the railway cut off part of the marshes and then textile and metal plants started to occupy the marshlands. Steam engines needed water, of course. Around 1900, the whole river marsh had been turned into some kind of industrial organic machine you see here on this picture. And what is left today is the typical post-industrial landscape with the plants uh, having relocated to other parts of the world and their environmental legacy, including sheep and vulnerable residences for factory workers still in place. Now, previous floods in the Meuse River Basin in 1993 and 1995 urged a paradigm shift in river management, a move away from hard infrastructure towards building with nature, um, room for the rivers, restoring winter beds where possible, creating extra buffer capacity for floodwaters, but also retaining waters as much as possible in periods of drought. And today, of course, there is a call for a new paradigm shift, a room for rivers, room for water 2.0, not only focused on the main rivers, but also on the tributaries. On the other hand, this might not be enough, and some river valleys might need to be evacuated completely. Or perhaps, perhaps the, the whole concept of river banks has to be um, rethought. It, it, it has to be abandoned, perhaps, as a sort of techno fix which tries to stabilize something which in the end is impossible to stabilize. What I want to address in my talk today is this logic of disaster spurred adaptation. It seems as though we always need a new crisis, a new disaster, a new shock to pave the way for major infrastructural changes. In systems ecology, this is known as the adaptive cycle you might associate with Buzz Holling uh, and other ecologists. A system, whether an ecosystem or an economic system, it grows and expands until it becomes rigid at a certain moment, and it's threatened increasingly in its survival by mounting external and internal pressures. And then there is the catharsis, the moment of shock, and the system at a certain moment collapses before being reshuffled, reconfigured, and changing in towards a new, a, a new system or a new version of the system and towards renewed growth. Is this just a narrative, a pretty dangerous one, which is so often repeated that it starts to materialize? Or is this indeed a historical pattern we, which we can observe in past experiences? To investigate this, I want to turn to the coastal wetlands of the North Sea area and the seawalls, which for thousand years now are the main infrastructure protecting the coastal marshes from flooding and allowing uh, a very intensive kind of land use and occupation. This region has a long history of disastrous floods, which are caused not by rainfall and river flooding, but by storm surges on the North Sea. And as you can see here, there are basically two or three of these major storm surges turning into extensive flooding in a century. There were, in the 15th century, we had the Elizabeth floods, which affected both low countries and England 600 years ago. Uh, in 1570, you had the All Saints flood, 
which was the first one for which high numbers of casualties can be observed. Then we have the most deadly one, which was the 1717 Christmas flood in the Wadden Sea area, the north of the Dutch Republic, Niedersachsen, uh, Schleswig. And the last one, 1953, the Zeeland flood, which killed about 2000 people and was turned into a cornerstone of Dutch national identity. We against the water. And I could add 1962 along the Elbe um, in northern Germany. These are all called, these are all caused by what is called a storm surge, a combination of a northwestern storm occurring in a period of high tides, spring tides. Storminess is much more difficult to reconstruct than temperature or precipitation. Does this chronology of flood disasters echo the chronology of storms? We do not know today. Storminess is certainly related to atmospheric pressure, and Western Europe, it seems, might be more affected by storms in periods of a strongly negative NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation. Some of the more disastrous floods are indeed occurring in periods of low NAO, but not all of them. The red dots um, are the counter-examples. Counter in any case, there is no such thing as a little ice age effect in storminess, whatever some people uh, have argued. It's simply not the case that there were more storms in the colder episodes of the little ice age. This is another dynamic. The technofix adopted around the year 1000 is the seawall. It's basic hard infrastructure, it seems, solid earthen walls. And at first sight, its history goes from hard to harder to hardest, ever more massive, ever more unbreakable. However, this is not really the case. As we will see, the same seawall could be hard and soft at the same time. It, it all depends on the social, the wider social and environmental context and on the expectations people had. Do we see major transitions spurred by storm surges? Do we see this process of a new crisis spurring a sort of transition change in the infrastructure in the system? If we look at the investments in flood control over the long term from the 13th to the 18th century, uh, the investments in an area in Zeeland, Flanders, you see here, uh, plotted, then you see that many storm surges didn't really change anything at all. At best, there was a temporary surge in investments to repair seawalls, but later it was business as usual. That's the blue dots. Only on two occasions, the red dots in two periods, we see a clear shift around 1400 towards a low investment regime. And after the storm surge of 1715 in this area, towards a considerably higher level of investments. These two transitions allow us to distinguish three different envirotechnical regimes, you could call them, which are not so much characterized by differences in technology. The technology basically remains more or less the same. This whole idea of sea walls, earthen walls, massive earthen walls, it doesn't change that much, but it's the environmental and social embedding of the seawall which changed considerably. The first regime is the regime of the coastal peasantries. And on this 16th century map, you see a seawall or two seawalls even in white constructed. The lower one is constructed in the 13th century, 1288. And it took five years to construct, five seasons and during every summer season, 2.3 kilometers was built as a collective enterprise by the whole community living in this coastal wetland area. Everyone was obliged to come over during a certain number of days with a spade or with a horse if he or even she uh, possessed one. These medieval sea walls, they demanded a lot of maintenance. Yearly investments were high. The environmental setting of the seawalls usually allowed for relatively large stretches of raised salt marsh in front of the seawall. And this had the advantage of both mitigating the strength of the waves, allowing for a swift repair of dike breaches, and allowing also for buffer capacity, mainly in the river estuaries. 
this was a nature-based solution uh, which we could verify uh, in the field and in the historic flood experience a few years ago, concentrating on the 1717 storm surge in the north of uh, the Netherlands. And where also today you could see that seawalls protected by salt marsh suffered significantly less uh, from dike breaches. And these dike breaches were also much smaller. This is a map from 1717, where a land surveyor mapped these differences during the storm surge. And where you could uh, see that the area protected by salt marsh suffered from less dike breaches, and these dike breaches were also smaller, whereas the, uh, the, the dike where there was no salt marsh was in fact completely washed away. This is building with nature as practiced in the Middle Ages in this region. Things were about, um, this, this does not mean that there were no uh, floods, that these dikes could not break. In fact, these medieval seawalls, they broke very often. Flooding was a very frequent experience, and you can still see this on the map by the horseshoe-shaped repairs in the seawalls. These are these, these, these little uh, semi-circles you see. That's a dike breach which is later repaired uh, every time and again. But frequent flooding, but not very intensive, small dike breaches. The second regime was the, the so-called polder capitalism. Capitalism in the polder marshes, which was introduced in the coastal wetlands before the end of the Middle Ages. Land reclamation in this model became a truly commercial venture in which merchant capitalists and noble families invested huge amounts of money and expected a considerable return on their investment. Such polders and drainage projects had massive seawalls, but with a profoundly different environmental embedding. As we see on this 18th century painting, the new um, seawalls are constructed not on raised salt marshes, but on directly on the mud floods. In fact, they were reclaiming water and not land, um, which of course they turned water into land, which of course resulted in seawalls, which were much more directly exposed to the, the full strength of the waves. Uh, these these seawalls were no longer constructed also by local peasants. They were constructed by uh, semi-professional laborers, often recruited in ever more distant regions, uh, in poor inland regions where there was an uh, excessive supply of labor. Uh, they were recruited to, to come over to the coastal wetlands to build these new seawalls. And these laborers were increasingly paid in standard wages per volume of earth, between three and eight cubic meters per day from the 16th century onwards. You, you really see a process of calculation, of simplification of the natural world, which is turned into simple volume of a uniform raw material processed in a certain shape, the seawall. These seawalls, they were not unbreakable, neither. But in con floods remained remarkably present throughout the early modern period. But in contrast to the medieval seawalls, if the more massive and more exposed seawalls of the early modern period broke, they broke massively. And they created huge core holes, which were very difficult to fill, and which are still visible in the landscape today as giant lake-like structures, uh, you could uh, say. We arrive to the final uh, environmental regime, which is in fact the modern regime, which gradually came into being in the 18th century. And what is new compared to the previous environmental regime is certainly the renewed role for the state. The state which considered floods in the 18th century increasingly as an offense by nature. Which, um, which could no longer be tolerated and which had to be addressed through military means, in fact. Um, it's the state who forced, for the first time in the 18th century, more inland areas to contribute on a permanent base to the upkeep of seawalls 
uh, to which these inland areas thought um, they had no interest in maintaining them. And they still contribute to, the, to, fiscal, to state fiscality until today to the maintenance of these infrastructures. So we have three environmental regimes, three envirotechnical regimes, uh, you could say, each corresponding to a different social env and environmental setting. What did trigger the change now? It was not storminess. Some storms, most storms did nothing. Most even major uh, storm surges causing widespread flooding. They didn't change the envirotechnical system. Uh, what did trigger change then? In my opinion, it was politics. It was a question of shifting power relations between stakeholders. The first transition towards the capitalist polders of the later Middle Ages and the Dutch Golden Age cannot be understood without the demise of coastal peasantries, which were massively expropriated. The second transition, which in our example was triggered by a storm surge, saw the return of local farming elites, which were capable of mobilizing the state uh, to ensure higher permanent investments in seawalls. This is a question of power relations between the stakeholders involved. And this brings me to the summer of 2021, to the river floods in Belgium and Northwest Germany, with four elements in guise of conclusion. First of all, whoever studies these coastal wetlands of the North Sea area cannot but conclude that the Anthropocene has very deep roots in this area. What happens in this region, and also in some other regions, like uh, Matteo's low plains of Lombardy, probably, is a sort of is a sort of clear prequel to the great transformation of the earth in the last centuries, with Fernand Brodel, Wallerstein, Moore, and Brenner. I fully agree that the capitalist mode of production, whether merchant or agrarian uh, capitalism, which becomes visible in this region before the end of the Middle Ages was a major driver of change in this process. Second conclusion, radical disruption of environmental envirotechnical infrastructures is rare and always remained rare. Examples of continuity and accumulation are much more visible, much more frequent, as also pointed out by Jean-Baptiste Fresseau and David Edgerton yesterday. Thirdly, Every change in these infrastructures, in these envirotechnical regimes, is a political process. It is seldom the unexpected result of some external shocks or crisis. Envirotechnical systems are not getting invariably more rigid, prone to disruption. What happens is that some people say that they are rigid or that, that they have become rigid, and they use environmental hazards and floods to proclaim the need for change. The results was not de per definition better. There was no process of continuous improvement, but the results suited other coalitions of stakeholders. And fourth and finally, the distinction between soft and hard infrastructures in the end makes little sense. Seawalls, like the one we studied in this paper, they can be both soft and hard. Moreover, the soft infrastructure, the building with nature, is not per definition better. It might sometimes put more people at risk. What seems to matter, however, is the same concept um, Helmut Rischler ended with in his keynote on Wednesday, is the idea of slow infrastructures, widening decision-making to involve more stakeholders uh, with an interest in the infrastructure and to open the public debate on the infrastructure. And this does not, per definition, limit um, major infrastructural changes, uh, whether gradual or, 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 um, or more radical, uh, which connects to uh, the, um, uh, what Frederick Graber explained in his talk yesterday. If we do not evolve uh, that way, if we do not um, widen this kind of decision-making to involve all people which have direct interest in the infrastructure, we remain stuck on the ruins 
of industrial modernity we saw this summer along the Vesda River in Belgium. Uh, thank you very much. She's PI of the ERC Starting Grant Project, Sea, Sand and People, an environmental history of coastal dunes. And Joanna holds a PhD um, um, in contemporary history. She's a researcher at the Center of History in the School of Arts and Humanities of the University of Lisbon. And in her work, she connects human and coastal areas, uh, land landscape transformation, cultural heritage, and uh, she looks at the environmental impacts uh, and the symbolic character of landscape. And today she will give a presentation titled Building Environments, Historical View on Dunes as Envirotechnical Landscapes. Thank you so much for being with us today and uh, I leave you the floor. Thank you, Virginia. So let's start for with the presentation. Yeah, I, I can tell you. If, oh, yes. OK. Yes, it yes. is visible. Thank you. Um, and then just. OK, so uh, good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me for this conference. It's it's really a pleasure to see uh, so many uh, known faces that would really enjoy meeting in Trento. Um, and to know uh, new colleagues. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you uh, about my work, um, uh, the dunes. And I will start by showing you this image uh, of Fortaleza in Brazil and asking you what you see in this image. For me, this image shows vulnerability. The vulnerability of all the cities erected in the edge of the ocean. When I think about the built environment in coastal areas, we think of this, cities and infrastructures. And their location near the ocean is what makes them vulnerable. Just look and see how the beach that narrow strip of sand, it's all that keeps this city apart from the water and the power of storm surge. And we can obviously see that it's not enough. There are no dunes here, but they were. Portaloza was built uh, on the dunes and they disappeared. This is a dune. Dunes are aeolian landforms that form in some regions, uh, in some coastal regions, when they have the right conditions. And the basic conditions to have a dune is to have an ample supply of dry sand, winds, and vegetation. There are no factors, of course, but basically a dune is formed and made by the sea, the winds, the sands, and some plants. They seem perfectly natural, but in many cases they aren't. They can be built too. In many regions, dunes are hybrids, a mix of human and non-human agents, envirotechnical landscapes, both natural and cultural ones. And so the issue that I'm going to address in this presentation is why are we humans building dunes. We build dunes because they are valuable. They are coastal protections. They work as barriers to storm surge and waves. They are warehouses of sand to nourish the beach during storm attack. They are so used in some countries for water storage and recreation, and they are valued as wildlife habitats. Look at this photo. This is from a Portuguese beach called Costa da Caparica. In here, we can see how the dune is used to protect the infrastructures that were built upon um, the beach. 
management of coastal environments in these last decades has been mainly about reduction or mitigation of the exposure of coastal communities to hazards caused by sea level rise. And the changing dynamics of coastal processes, in many cases caused by human interference. All the line is still the main strategy worldwide. And this, is, this line is kept by using engineering works to protect and maintain a line that we have created because there are no fixed lines in the coast. Dunes are buffer areas and they are valued by scientists and coastal managers exactly because they have this natural aesthetic and they can work as uh, protective barriers. And they have fewer impacts than groins and seawalls. Normally, when we go to the beach, we prefer to see the dunes to walls made of stone. And this is why dunes are often included in shore protection design projects as building with nature solution. Only the dunes fall under the scope of natural sciences and coastal management, which are mainly interested in how in their physical, morphological, and ecological features. The present problems connected with sea level rise and dune erosion, and the solutions found to rehabilitate these environments. So what can the humanities add about the dunes? When I look to the dunes as the dunes in the beach or in the archives, because I'm an historian, through the lens of a humanities scholar, I see many things. And in my head, associations are made and questions pop up. And today, I want to share with you some of my thoughts and associations. Let's start with their story. Not long a long time ago, dooms were mostly seen as dangerous things, places of fear, dread environments. In many European countries, the sand was blown by the wind and was moving inland, covering houses, farmhouses, agricultural fields and villages. The moving dunes forced people to abandon their lands. It was silting harbors in the mouth of rivers, um, difficulting navigation or making it impossible. It was also creating wetlands associated with miasmas and diseases. So in the 18th and 19th century historical sources, what we can see is dunes being described as enemies that had to be fought and eliminated. And in here, I remember um, the talk of Simone Muller yesterday when she mentioned that marshes were seen as hostile environments. And this is exactly the case of the dunes. They were considered hostile and they needed to be uh, eradicated. In the 19th and 20th century, from France to Denmark, Germany, Scotland, Spain, and Portugal, states, local authorities, and privates were interested in stabilizing the dunes, prevent them from moving. And they would do this by putting fences, planting beach grasses and pines to transform the dunes into forests, like some of the examples that I've brought you here a map of the afforestation of the Teste de Bouche in France uh, in the 18th century, and some examples of Portugal and Mozambique of works made by the Portuguese forestry services. Curiously, all this afforestation of the dunes started by making a dune, the first one, the dune closest to the, the ocean, called the Fordune, because it would be that dune it would be the barrier against the waves, the wind and the sand coming from the ocean that would protect the plantings that were done uh, in the, its rear. The dune was then an environmental technical thing or an infrastructure as Giacomo Paricelli uh, mentioned yesterday. But stabilizing the sands, transforming dunes into forests was not something uh, exclusive from Europe. It was also done in other continents, in America, in Africa, in Oceania and Asia. 
So the history of the attempts to stabilize the dunes in the 19th and in the beginning of the 20th century, the, the way they were thought they were used as envirotechnical things are connected and allow us to explore other stories, our own history, and to think about things like state building, land reclamation, control of resources, institutions, experts, empires, circulation of knowledge, people, and species. But that's not all. Dunes can also illustrate the complexities of human life, showing how ideas, values, and paradigm shift and contradict. In the second half of the 20th century, ideas about the dunes change. As the beach became a recreational place, the playground for the elites, and later a tourist de destination for the elites, for the masses, dunes became recreational and recreational areas. At the same time, coastal science development brought a new understanding about the rule, the rule of dunes in the beach dune system. Science became aware as that dunes could be in our uh, buffer areas. But at the same time that they were being discovered in the 20th century, they were also being destroyed by all the development that was being done in the coastal areas. Building houses in, in dunes, sand mining. See the picture. This is the case of a beach in Portugal. We can see here how the houses were built on the beach, destroying the dunes. How the church was built on the beach, on the dunes, and people was passing, and the cars were drove in the dunes, destroying that specific ecosystem. So, also in the 20th century, dunes become protected environments, and sand is brought from other places to refill beaches threatened by erosion. Bulldozers rebuild the lost dunes, and art engineering structures are made to trap the sand. And here we can see a, a, a dune, or it's more a pile of sand because it's not really a dune, being built to protect this beach and the infrastructures that were made to access the beach. So we are rehabilitating what we have previously previous destroyed. We are building dunes to protect the cities and the infrastructures that destroy them. And in a way, thinking about the idea that Giacomo used yesterday, dunes have, if we consider what he said, um, infrastructures have become infrastructures as they are part of practices, politics, and dynamics to assure that they keep providing their services. It's everything about value. Dunes are being protected because they provide goods and services. And this can also say a lot about the human way of seeing the world as an ecosystem services provider and fixing it according to some purposes. The ecosystem service framework is used uh, for many things uh, in present days to evaluate the benefits people obtain from ecosystems and the ability of those ecosystems to provide the desired services. This assessment is used to determine which set of services is, mostly, is, mo is most highly valued. And it, this, is, this evaluation is translated in, into economic gain, uh, into a monetary value. And the system is managed according to that monetary value. And this kind of approach always makes me think about something that Olga Tukarts, the Polish Nobel laureate, wrote. One of her characters asks, why should we be useful and in relation to what? Who divided the world into useful and useless and by what right? We all know the benefits of what is useful, but no one knows the benefits of what is useless. And this idea of usefulness, the usefulness of things, change. Dooms were useless, but now they are not. 
So should we keep managing ecosystems based in their known value? What about the values that we still do not know and have yet to discover? What happens if we destroy them before we discover how much we need them? And if they never need and if we never need them? Can we keep things that do not have a value for us? Sarah Pritchard says that envirotechnical things or landscapes are physical hybrids of ecological and technological systems. And the history of dunes allows to see this that they are both, they have become shaped by many different forces, beings and convergences. I'm talking about the sea, the wind, the sand, vegetation, animals, but also humans, perceptions, values, policies, knowledge, fences and bulldozers. We can stabilize the dunes, we can frame them, but as they grow, as they move, transform and erode, they have a direct impact in our lives. Both humans and dunes affect each other's stories. And I brought you this case, this example of a dune invading a house in Santa Catarina at the beginning of this year. And in here, we can see how dunes and humans are so deeply connected because these houses were built on the dunes and the dunes invaded the houses. And this is what Ian Oder, an archaeologist, calls entanglement. He uses the concept of entanglement to say that human interference with natural system bonds them, humans, to sustain some kind of continuous form of care regulation to maintain the systems so they keep producing, working, or behaving like they are supposed to. And since they have different temporal scales and rhythms. The labor and the costs invested in carrying this work of keeping ecosystems, as well as the, the, process, the processes and the routines of keeping the world as we think it should be, trap us in long-term actions and impacts that cross generations. Ian Oder says that entanglements are provisional they work out in practice as humans continuously change their minds. And we have seen this. The dunes were useless and now they are valuable. And things have a life of their own. And I think again about Giacomo and what he said yesterday about water being an infrastructure because it can be, it's predictable. Um, and I think it's interesting because all the about a different thing. It talks about the unpredictability, the unpredictable unruliness of things. We try to rationalize, to standardize, or to fix the world, but the world can, be, can easily get out of control exactly because things are unpredictable and have this way of not behaving like we want them to do. And I show you, I, I brought you here this image. This is a picture that I took in the summer when I was having uh, my vacation. And this is a hole in the middle of a street. There was a water pipe rupture uh, in that night, and so the road collapsed. And when I was passing by, I saw the hole, and I saw that inside the hole there was sand. In the beginning, I was surprised why there was so much sand inside that hole. And then I remember that that village where I was, spending, I was spending my vacation was built on the dunes. So the dunes were destroyed, they disappeared, but in a way, they are still there. The sand is still there. And it has this strange way of showing itself when it's less expected. And I have another example for you about the unpredictability of things. When the European moved to other continents, um, when they colonized new territories, they brought a lot of agricultural practices. They introduced cattle to some regions where there were no cattle before, like uh, Australia or New Zealand. 
in those kind of practices, agricultural practices, and uh, the destruction of the forests also affected the dunes by disturbing the vegetation that grew on those dunes. And without vegetation, the dunes became uh, mobile. They start moving inland, uh, the same as had happened in Europe before. And so the European settlers in New Zealand, Australia, or in the Oregon coast, in the US uh, Pacific, introduced in these regions a plant called Ammophila arenaria that they used in Europe to stabilize the dunes. The plant Ammophila revealed very effective in stabilizing the dunes of Australia or New Zealand or, the, or Oregon. However, it became invasive. And when ideas change about the dunes in the 20th century, that was considered uh, a problem. And so in these countries and in this uh, region, the Oregon, efforts are now being made to eradicate Ammophila arenaria and to recover native flora and habitats. And this shows how things can behave and can be unpredictable because we use them for some for one thing to solve one problem and then they cause new problems. This happens too because the symbolic, cultural, emotional, political, economic and social discourses, ideas change over the years and they introduce new significations to the world. And we can see this by studying the dunes. Moreover, we can see that societies are not current units and different models and, and solutions can drift in the same period, coexisting or antagonizing uh, each other. For instance, managing dunes in present times, um, we don't have only one solution, but there are several. For instance, some uh, are interested in managing dunes through the prism of dune ecology. They want to achieve the mass in biodiversity by preserving priority species, the ones that they consider rare or they are um, or more beautiful or whatever. The critics of this uh, call it dune gardening because they say that they are privileging some species and eliminating others according to a human wish list. Because dune gardening focus on the static preserva preservation of some key species and habitats, preventing natural succession in the dunes. But in a way, this is not much different of keeping dunes just as piles of sand against the water. Piles of sand that can be done and redone after each storm. In fact, what we know is that for dunes to evolve naturally as envirotech or as environmental technical landscapes, adapting to the ongoing environmental changes, they need basically two things, sand and space. But sand is getting scarce as sand has become a, most, uh, a, a valuable and important commodity. In space, well, Think about Fortaleza. How much space is there in that beachfront for dunes, if they exist, to move inland as a strategy to survive to the rising seas in the future? If there is not enough sand or space for dunes to shift inland, they will not survive. But this discussion is not just about the dunes. The future of the dunes is also the future of our cities and infrastructures built on the coast. Because it is necessary to make room for water and, sa and sand to safeguard them too. As dunes, cities and infrastructures may need to shift inland, retreat, survive. A presentation with some final, very personal uh, remarks. I like the dunes. What I like about the dunes is their flowing hybrid character. They allow to link history, 
or the humanities in general with science. They cross past, present, and future, connecting stories, concerns, and hopes. We can use them to connect big issues of history or, big is or the big history of nations, empires, institutions, experts, uh, economy, and society with a little local case of coastal communities or just a beach. Dunes can inspire us, inspire us to think about space, uh, about going to Mars, because the science used in the dunes of Mars is, Mars is based in, science, in the science of the dunes on Earth. We can dive into fiction with dunes. Uh, for instance, with the sand plan, a planet called by, um, created by Frank Herbert, one of the best sci-fi uh, books ever written. Or you can be surprised by the sand grains that stick to our feet after a wonderful day at the beach. Dunes are these strange things, environments, landscapes, whatever you want to call them, blown by the wind, trapped by beach grass roots, where we can lay down and dream. But we can, always, we can also use them to reflect about us, about the world and the future that we want build. Yesterday, Simone Muller was talking about toxicity as an analytic tool. We can talk about dunes. We can use them to critically think about the Anthropocene in relation uh, with, in our relation uh, with uh, the coasts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is Christoph Cornelissen speaking again. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to all the speakers of this afternoon for your highly instructive papers and also for the lively discussion, uh, which uh, probably uh, needs to be extended. But unfortunately, we have reached al already the time limit uh, provided for this section. And my question now goes directly to John McNeil, whether he's prepared to go on without any extra break or all of us maybe this question should be directed to all of us i would suggest that we uh, carry on uh, instead of um, having another break is there any one amongst you who would like to protest either publicly or uh, by writing something down in the chat so i'll give you this opportunity it seems that most of us almost all of us are content in carrying on. I think we should try to, to do this right now. Now, we have almost reached the end of this wonderful conference, which is wonderful in many respects, uh, intellectually, but also, as, it, as I said, so lively, even though we are all trying our best to work online only. Now, we've reached almost the end, but a highlight is still await, awaiting us. John. McNeil will round off this conference with a couple of final reflections and comments. And of course, we are extremely happy that he found the time to participate in this conference. Uh, now, it doesn't make sense, probably, to present this last speaker to you. All of you know, know him for various reasons. You're all specialists in the field, which is um, being investigated by John McNeil, or has been investigated for decades. So just let me confine my presentation to three major titles, and they may be the wrong ones, and you will probably like to add other ones, but I, I've chosen just three titles. John McNeil, Something New Under the Sun, an Environmental History of the 20th Century World. The second title he brought out, together with Peter Engelke, the Great Acceleration and Environmental History of Anthropocene in 2016. And last, the last title I would like to mention here is The Webs of Humankind, a two-volume study which came out in 2020. And that's it for the moment. Of course, we could carry on for at least half an hour just presenting different institutional affiliations, important findings, and other publications. But I hope it's okay to stop make a stop at this very moment. 
John, the floor is yours and we are looking forward to your comments. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's still morning here where I am. Uh, you've done me a great favor by forcing me to go to bed early and get up early over the last few days. So uh, I want to try to keep my remarks uh, brief, particularly as uh, you haven't had a break for a while. I do want to say thanks to the organizers for including me uh, in this. Uh, it's been very stimulating to hear the talks and see the presentations. I also want to say thanks to everybody who's been operating in their second or third language. As a native speaker of English, I am amongst the, what I think is only three people at this conference who's been enjoying the language subsidy of being a native speaker. So thank you uh, to all for that. I'm gonna take the point of view of trying to make suggestions for the editors about how to get from a conference to a uh, publication. Obviously the first thing that you need is excellent papers. Fortunately, you have them. The second thing you need is threads to unite uh, at least some of the papers. Rarely can you find threads that will unite them all. So I'll suggest a, a, a number of threads, maybe six or seven. Uh, probably most of these you will want to discard, but perhaps uh, one or two of them you will want to emphasize uh, in an introduction and perhaps use in organizing the publication uh, into parts. So that's what I'm about to do. But first, in his keynote, uh, Helmut asked me directly about my experience as a member of the Anthropocene Working Group. So I thought I would answer that briefly. Uh, before getting into the substance of my remarks about the conference. So my main observation as a historian, one of two historians working with um, a group that's overwhelmingly made up of geologists and within that stratigraphers, my main observation is what I call the clash of periodizations. Uh, you may know that there was a, a, a misguided book some years ago called The Clash of Civilizations. In the Anthropocene Working Group, we have a clash of periodizations in two senses. Uh, one is that the geologists, unsurprisingly, are often interested in extremely long uh, periods of time, whereas the historians, myself and Naomi Oreskes, uh, usually take what for them are uh, trivial uh, perspectives on time. But more interesting than that for me is that the geologists uh, have to vote on periodization. And this is going to happen with respect to the uh, Anthropocene. It's already happened uh, within the Anthropocene Working Group. Uh, it's going to happen at the higher levels uh, in due course. And as a historian, of course, this seems very peculiar because uh, historians do not vote on periodization. Historians do whatever they like with respect to periodization. So, um, and often we make suggestions and nobody pays sort of anthropological curiosity of the way different disciplines uh, operate. Um, so that's um, what I wanted to say about my experiences with the Anthropocene Working Group. Now, remarks about the papers and the conferences. Uh, first point is that uh, a small handful of the papers, I think I would say three, were 
uh, directed towards either uh, theoretical or historiographical uh, positions. And some of the other papers touched on this, but didn't really uh, dive into it. So um, one thing that the uh, editors might wish to do is either group those two or three together, or perhaps uh, also ask other authors to try to um, develop whatever reflections they may have on theoretical and historiographical uh, positions. And uh, within that, one potentially promising direction is the, uh, the agency of things, which came up um, at least indirectly in a couple of the papers. Ian Hodder, the archeologist was mentioned. Um, some other theorists uh, in this vein are uh, Jane Bennett, the political philosopher. Uh, and of course, Latour. Second observation, there are great inconsistencies uh, among the papers about just what constitutes uh, infrastructure. I think that's inevitable. I don't think the editors could try to impose uh, any uh, narrowing of definition uh, upon the authors. Some of the papers, address this directly and talk about what qualifies as infrastructure, most do not. Um, perhaps uh, the editors would like to encourage the authors who have not done so to reflect on what constitutes uh, infrastructure in their particular uh, understanding of the term. Or perhaps the editors themselves need to reflect uh, on this theme and admit the inconsistency from paper to paper uh, about how infrastructure is understood. Third observation, uh, it's really something that I was uh, curious about, left curious about in many of the papers, even though it was addressed to some extent in some of the papers, and that is um, labor. So in some cases, I think we have specialists in environmental infrastructure. So as you know, in many parts of the world, there are specialist well diggers. Uh, and I would bet that the people building the stue that we learned about on the first day were also specialists, but I don't know. I expect there's, uh, in many instances, classes of skilled uh, specialists involved, but there's also, uh, oh, and I should say that these might well be mobile, moving from um, valley to valley, region to region, selling their expertise. But there's probably also uh, a cheap labor component in environmental infrastructure, people digging canals, uh, building seawalls, extracting peat, um, and so forth. And uh, in this respect, the uh, price of labor might be an important consideration in both the construction and the maintenance of environmental infrastructure. And so fluctuations in the price of labor, uh, the availability of cheap labor, uh, might be an interesting thing to consider in some of the papers where as far as I could tell, it hasn't been considered. Fourth observation, and this one will come as no surprise to you because you've heard the question that I posed to Joanna and you heard the question that I posed to Christoph Bernhardt uh, on the first day, and that's about military priorities. It seems to me that in the early modern European papers, there might be some room for uh, reflection on the degree to which the uh, authorities building and maintaining uh, infrastructure were guided by anxieties about their vulnerability to siege. They wanted to have water, they wanted to have grain, maybe even wood um, supplies that would be secure against siege because sieges were so common in early modern Europe. 
in the more modern periods, uh, especially the uh, early 20th century, I would expect that the, the power ministries, as they're sometimes called, the Ministry of War, the Navy, the security ministers, interior ministries, would also be at the table or behind the scenes when it comes to uh, governmental decisions about environmental infrastructure, just because they were so powerful. Uh, and some of you have, have written about um, military um, components of environmental history and infrastructure history, especially in the context of the Cold War. I think there might be more to reflect upon here uh, for both the early modern and the uh, modern papers. Fifthly, integration of the international and the local. Several of the papers did this very nicely, I thought. Other papers didn't try to do it at all. And so I think there might be room either for clustering papers that do make this uh, a point of emphasis or asking some authors who haven't done it at all whether they would like to uh, try to include uh, a few paragraphs about larger perspectives and how they may have influenced the practices and decisions on local scales. Uh, sixthly or seventhly, I've lost track. Um, the role of private interests versus public authorities. Again, several papers took this on directly, but because environmental or envirotech uh, infrastructure is so often a, a collective good, it normally creates problems about uh, who is going to build it and who's going to maintain it. And collateral problems about the degree of participation by the public in decision-making, the public either in general or um, subsets of the public, you know, um, powerful interests uh, within societies. Some of the papers I think could reflect more on precisely this theme um, and there may be interesting patterns over the five or 600 years that are best represented uh, in these papers. There may be interesting patterns in terms of difference among regions, different amongst differences amongst uh, mountain valleys, coasts, uh, differences among different types of environmental infrastructure, water, energy, um, transport, so I thought there might be some room for um, development on the part of some of the authors uh, in that regard. Nextly, uh, climate change, uh, particularly as regards uh, water infrastructure. And in the discussion just now, uh, we got into that, um, but obviously, Water uh, infrastructure is particularly sensitive to uh, short-term flux and long-term shifts uh, in rainfall. But even um, timber transport uh, infrastructure uh, is uh, sensitive to things like uh, snowfall, as we learned uh, on the first day. So uh, even when it may not be relevant, as it may not be in the case of uh, uh, coastal protection uh, in the low countries around the North Sea. Um, it seems to me that if that is the case in other papers, that might be said uh, in other papers, but it may also be the case that uh, climate shifts and shocks do have some bearing on uh, the construction and maintenance um, and perhaps even the falling out of use of uh, envirotech uh, infrastructure. 
So again, some of the papers touched on that very lightly, um, others not at all. I'm getting to the end here. Um, gender and family. Um, this comes up hardly at all uh, in any of the papers, although some of the images that we saw in the presentations um, suggested it. Um, fuel wood collection, water collection, these things were often and many times in places the responsibility of uh, women and children, the duty of women and children. And so decisions about the construction, the siting, the maintenance, the abandonment of uh, infrastructure that has to do with water and uh, fuel uh, presumably affected women and children in very direct ways. Uh, I think the same might be uh, relevant with respect to peat extraction, but I'm not sure, uh, definitely not sure in the case of Russia, uh, how that was uh, apportioned uh, socially. At any rate, um, the envirotech infrastructure was probably not built with the interests uh, or of women and children in mind. They probably don't show up very well in the sources but it might be worth more reflection on what envirotech infrastructure decisions meant uh, for women and children in the times and places uh, detailed uh, in the papers. Uh, last point. Um, Way or another, either exclusively or significantly with water uh, infrastructure. Uh, I'm including the coastal ones uh, as well as those that deal with uh, freshwater issues. So, energy infrastructure and transport infrastructure seem a little bit uh, underrepresented relative to water and relative to their importance to human societies, or so it seemed to me. I don't think there's anything that can be done about this from the point of view of organizing a publication, but um, I, mean, I don't think there's anything that can be changed about it is what I mean, uh, but it might be something that the uh, editors would wish to reflect upon in an introduction uh, or use as a principle in organizing uh, the eventual publication. So that's it from me. Uh, I do again want to congratulate the, well, both the organizers and the uh, presenters for what, for me at least, was educational. Uh, absorbing, uh, and also um, inspiring uh, the depth of research and um, the range of uh, research that we have just uh, borne witness to in the last few days um, is very impressive. And um, I think the organizers should feel pleased with the result. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you indeed for your wonderful comment, stimulating comments, and also for the fact that you sort of designed a volume of high of a high value, uh, which may come out of this conference. Uh, we have some experience, of course, with uh, bringing together people from different countries uh, on different subject matters, but uh, I think this this conference really merits a very very good. Uh, um, work on and and, and um, um, literally a precise argument in the way uh, you designed in, in, 
in your comments. And uh, I'm sure Katya and, and Giacomo will fall back, not just on your comments, but might turn back to you in order to discuss their final version for the volume which we will produce.